Hey everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, today, I would like to talk about programming web applications with F Sharp and basically retargeting them to kind of move away from JavaScript into WebAssembly. I'm going to be using uh, two technologies, one uh, WebSharper and the other Bolero to uh, present some of these ideas. Uh, and hopefully you can learn something from this. Uh, we had certainly been working a lot, quite heavily with WebSharper uh, to develop web applications. And in recent years, uh, there had been this steady move. Uh, a lot of cost customers have been asking about how could they better utilize WebAssembly, uh, for example, for some of their more computationally intensive uh, tasks that they have surfaced onto uh, thin web clients. Uh, so this probably affects a lot of people. Uh, the technologies to enable that had been around for quite some time. So I'm just going to uh, dip our toes into this whole ecosystem uh, in this talk. There's just so much, just enormous amount of uh, projects, huge amounts of information about uh, this topic, other language communities, uh, most notably Rust, had been extremely active in the area. And I think they have a lot of inspiration to give to us uh, developers coming from other ecosystems. So uh, with that, let me uh, jump into WebSharper. We only have uh, limited time here, so I'm going to be quite quick uh, and trying to basically uh, maximize our time. I think the easiest way to get started would be the CLI, the .NET CLI. Uh, you can install, uh, so here I'm showing the commands to actually install Bolero and also WebSharper. So you can do .NET new and then dash I, and basically either Bolero.templates or WebSharper.templates. This will put uh, the project templates onto your system. Clearly, you will need the .NET SDK just even to use the .NET command and also to have all the build tools and everything available. So once you have that, uh, you can, of course, create new projects. Uh, in the Bolero templates, there is a minimalist approach. So this Bolero-app uh, code name or pseudo name, uh, the name of the template, uh, can be configured using different uh, switches on the command line. Uh, you can opt into just generating a client-side code that will be run on WebAssembly, or you can have a server client uh, application. Uh, so you can configure that. You can read more in the documentation page that I'm going to show you uh, in a few minutes. On the web shopper sites uh, or side, things are a bit different. Uh, we have different uh, project templates uh, for different scenarios that you might actually run into. For example, if you're needing a uh, single page application, uh, then you can do uh, .NET new web shopper dash spa. Still give some uh, switches on the command line, that, like the name of the project. Uh, if you prefer, you can actually use C Sharp in addition to F Sharp. So these templates uh, are bilingual, so you can have uh, support for C Sharp as well. Or if you want an HTML application or a full client server application, you can use WebSharper-Web. There are other templates. I'm not going to uh, talk about these today. There is a nice documentation page that describes them. We are about to release WebSharper 6, uh, probably early next week. And there will be a new documentation site with a lot of extra information that we didn't have before. So once you created a project, you can edit your projects. You can run them using just .NET run, or you can use uh, .NET build to build to see for compilation errors. You can toggle the verbosity of the compiler output. It's, it's all basic uh, .NET SDK stuff. So the two websites to watch out for is uh, fsbolero.io and webshopper.com. Uh, I urge you to uh, have a quick read just to see if you are into these uh, technologies. I think they're quite fun. So <clears throat> to help you uh, get convinced about WebSharper, uh, there's this site, Try WebSharper. You can go online. Uh, the link is on the bottom. And you can uh, basically um, try out snippets of WebSharper code without actually installing anything or preparing anything on your system. Uh, this is actually quite nice. Uh, you can, uh, we will be looking at some of the examples, so don't worry. Uh, you can also create your own. You can uh, reference 
dozens and dozens of, of different JavaScript libraries that we call bindings or extensions into your snippets. And then you can do charting like what we see here. You can do games, you can do all kinds of other stuff. Uh, by default, most of the samples will be reactive. So UI, webshopper.ui as, as a reference will be uh, given. Um, and I think it's quite fun to actually get started looking at some of these snippets and seeing what people have invented. I think it's quite fun. All right, so let, let's uh, just jump. This is without any coding, so I'm not gonna, for this part at least, not gonna demonstrate anything code. But if I was, uh, to actually put this into a project, I would probably create uh, a simple, like a minimal web shop replication. There's a template for that, of course, and just paste this very code that we see here uh, and run it. So in about a minute, we could get this to run and uh, it would say, hello world. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that if you look at the main uh, function or binding here, you can see that we are using application that single page. So this actually will give us a single page uh, HTML application. And the content of that will be a simple H1 tag as we see hello world. Now, <clears throat> you can imagine you could write all kinds of uh, HTML combinators here uh, uh, to create markup. Uh, we actually recommend that you use HTML templates, external files, so you can make changes to those. Uh, we will be seeing that here in a second, but I wanted to uh, just basically reinforce this fact that we have found through working on number, uh, probably dozens and dozens of different web applications that the developer workflow goes very much like this. You want to see kind of in an abstract way what the application will look like. So you typically want to have some kind of an HTML mock-up, a wireframe, or even maybe concrete HTML designs for the application at hand that you want to code. Now, of course, all of that will be pretty much lifeless. Uh, there won't be any kind of interactivity because the uh, application hasn't been written yet. But then you start taking that and treating that as a template and marking certain areas of the template. Uh, maybe you define inner templates. Within those templates, you actually uh, define placeholders where well, things will be uh, served and injected. Uh, and then you start writing the application logic. So this requires millions or thousands or hundreds of recompilation steps. So we had realized this early on that uh, it would be very beneficial to be able to load changes to the markup without actually requiring recompilation of the application. And this is what basically uh, HTML templating via type providers uh, gets us in a couple slides down the road. Uh, I will have a couple examples. So just keep in mind that instead of like what we do here, inlining the H1 or, uh, in, or writing in code uh, HTML combinators, we actually would recommend you to use outside external templates uh, for this presentation layer. Um, couple more advanced uh, examples. So this is exactly the same kind of application uh, skeleton. Here we defined an endpoint type with uh, two discriminated unions. And we had attribute using attributes like the end endpoint attribute here. Uh, we could refine what happens with these endpoints. So we basically here just refined that they should be accessible at slash, which is the root of the application or slash weather which would be another endpoint. And then as you can see, whether in this case takes a string argument. So down in the main, uh, we have application.multipage now, which would be a standard uh, application, client server application. So here what we see is we basically can just pattern match on the discriminated union endpoint type to see what kind of request came in. And all of the work involved in parsing the request uh, down to converting into this endpoint type and then matching on it to see what we should return. All of that work is automated and we don't have to worry about it. Now, obviously there's a lot of uh, details um, that should be mentioned here about refining these endpoints. What if I want to have a post, a get or uh, a delete HTTP verb? 
uh, what if I want to post like a JSON object from which I want to extract certain things? What if I have form data that I want to get the data from, uh, post it to some of these endpoints? You can do all of that. Um, and then once you have uh, in a pattern match, the actual F-sharp representation of the endpoint, like in this case, one of the discriminated union shapes, then you can respond. For example, if somebody requested the homepage, then we return the homepage, which would probably be some kind of a template-based uh, HTML response. In case of a weather, we get as, a, as an argument or parameter. And then we, as you can see here, just base uh, 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 you can do on the version. So that's a typo. But in, in case of form data, for example, we are expecting to pass the name and age component uh, as form data uh, coming from our uh, form tags in HTML. Or in the third example, we are trying to get uh, a JSON uh, representation of an order, which in this case would follow the structure defined by the type order data below. So it would have an item and a quantity. Now, obviously, this could be made into a list. And more uh, and composing it into larger data structures, uh, you can pretty much do that without limitation. And uh, obviously, at some point, you, you're going to find that uh, uh, coding everything into JSON and posting to the endpoint is is, is the uh, fastest way to ship large uh, amounts of data or varied data into service endpoints or or uh, uh, yeah service endpoints. And to produce some kind of an output, you can use the uh, site template that was just given in the previous page, like here, uh, depending on your endpoint returning JSON or uh, files or uh, maybe error code if you if you want to have some kind of redirection or signal some kind of an error or the actual HTML content like homepage does here. I should also talk a little bit about uh, reactivity. Although in this talk, we're going to use MVU, the model view update pattern. Uh, so here, reactivity in WebShopper is, is supplied by the functionality from WebShopper UI, uh, the library. So in pretty much any one of my applications, WebShopper applications that I recently worked on, basically I had WebShopper, of course, as a, as a core dependency. And the second core dependency was webshopper.ui. So it's kind of like a ubiquitous reference or dependency that I have in my applications. Now, obviously, some people are different, but I'm pretty much, uh, I could almost, almost certainly say that uh, webshopper.ui is the primary means of producing uh, HTML and uh, reactive HTML applications with webshopper. It's not the only one. You can make your own HTML uh, representation if you wanted. And we will actually see with uh, Bolero how you can change the HTML representation within the within a framework. So you could actually execute that pretty much the same way in WebShopper, just supply another HTML library uh, using just a reference, uh, a library reference, and keep using that. But a lot of the uh, convenience code and helper functions, like for sitelets, for example, are geared towards using WebShopper UI uh, elements or docs, as we have here. So anyhow, uh, I think it's time that I show some actual code running. So in the bottom, uh, I have some links. So I'm going to try to uh, open the first one. So this should be the first one to kind of demonstrate to you how you can do uh, reactive uh, computation. So, so the idea here is very simple. I want to type something here. As I can see, I'm going to echo something underneath. And what I'm echoing is what's written in the actual text box. And I map it to uppercase. And I basically convert it back to a text view, which view in this case means the actual snapshot of a reactive variable like var, which here is bound to the input control. So actually, I should get capitalized or uppercased uh, version of what I'm typing into the box, which is exactly what happens. All right, so it looks pretty simple, pretty painless. Um, let me see this other one here. 
So this kind of goes against the idea of uh, not using inline HTML, but remember this is a website where we have uh, uh, snippets, although there is a markup tab and I could have actually used uh, HTML templating and then just inject it uh, using the type provider that would have saved me all of this code, but it's, it's okay. It's a long, it's a small, short example anyhow. So what this is doing is there's an input box, hello. And then we are basically mapping what's typed into that input box, two different things, capitalized, reversed, we've count the words. So you can see that now we are changing. So once I have a hello world, you can see that how things change. And here, the mouse coordinates is a view. Of course, all of these views are assembled into a table and they are basically uh, output here uh, using this uh, list of map. Basically, we map each of those uh, key value pairs into uh, just docs, uh, HTML snippets, and we concatenate them and put them into a T body. And then in the main content, we just basically have the input field and then we have this output table, which is this guy here. So within that, of course, we see this last one, the mouse coordinates coming from this view mouse coordinates view, which here is basically, instead of just mapping the input like all of these other ones do, it's actually mapping a, an external input, which coming, comes from the uh, mouse. So here, if I'm on the application itself, I can always access where my mouse sits. And we basically just get the X and Y coordinates and then we just output them as a uh, little string and then we just show that. But you can see it's pretty, uh, pretty fast. Uh, there are a couple other snippets like drawing, for example, on a canvas that you can see here on TriWeb Sharper. Uh, in fact, um, uh, yeah, sorry. I want to show that, but then I realize it's there's so many examples and snippets here that it's, it's difficult. So um, let's switch back to the slide here. If you are more interested, if you are, if you want to kind of understand what's happening underneath, like these, how how these reactive variables and their views and how they are projected out into reactive HTML. If you're interested in that, there's a paper uh, on the uh, awesome web shopper list which is a community uh, repo uh, uh, that we have uh, linking some of the material on web shopper so there is a documentation oh no actually there's a publication section on that awesome web shopper list which is also available by the way if you go to the uh, main web shopper website so you can go into um, the main web shopper website so we were on this try online uh, section. You can also have blogs, forums, support, documentation, etc. Uh, and what I'm talking about is this link here, awesome web shopper. Uh, this has uh, an academic publication site. And uh, basically you can read this paper or any one of the papers really uh, talking about um, the actual reactive foundation underneath and some pragmatic applied topics on top. For example, uh, piglets, uh, reactive forms. Uh, these are pluggable view models, very interesting things. Uh, as you can see, they are kind of, uh, I wouldn't say outdated. They're definitely not outdated. They are still state of the art, uh, but they have been around for eight, 10 years. So a lot of this has been out. Uh, hasn't really been picked up that much. Uh, I would hope that uh, some of these ideas will come to more attention and people will learn about them. All right, so this is what we saw. Okay, now let's talk about templating. So if you haven't seen WebSharper or maybe just in the broader sense uh, F-Sharp before, you probably need some explanation on this type line. So type my template equals and then this uh, code here. This is actually an invocation of a type provider. So what's happening here is that we take the webshop.html file, we traverse it based on the type provider's logic, and we are looking for certain placeholders, and then we create types. 
which may or may not have other inner code entities uh, like members or properties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here, my templates will become a whole space of types, like a type space, and in it, there there must be. We are not showing the HTML file source here, but within it, I can see that there is a main uh, sort of inner template, which also has like title, shopping cart, items to buy as placeholders. So those are the places where I can inject content. The title here is a string placeholder. Shopping cart is probably a DOM node placeholder where I can actually inject HTML. And then the sent order is probably an event handler, probably an on-click event on a button, like a send order button, uh, which on the UI makes it possible that I just basically, whatever I have accumulated in my shopping cart, I want to send it uh, as my final order. So it, it then uh, can be sent to the server for processing. So this is pretty much how the application from an initial coding standpoint would look like. And remember, in the, in the beginning of the talk, we, we said that you, you want to have some kind of a, a concrete or abstract or wireframe design. So that's encapsulated in your webshop.html. And then defining the proper placeholders, event handlers, uh, you can actually put the code for them in a, in a code very similar to, to this. So this is how you would then externalize everything that has to do with the presentation layer. And at this point, if I compile my application, and I go and make changes in the web shop HTML file, then the application doesn't have to be recompiled. It just automatically gets all those changes. Now, obviously, this is a behavior that you might want to alter. So you can actually pass arguments to the templating uh, type provider to say, hey, watch the source files for changes and only load if there is a change. Or you may actually say, I don't want any changes to propagate. I may actually change the file, but I don't want the application to reload. Uh, so you can you can kind of gravitate in between those. Two. Uh, typically, the the right choice is in maybe some production environments. Uh, disable the watch or the monitoring. Maybe you want to still have it on. It's up to you. Uh, so def definitely, uh, there's some uh, interesting. Uh, scenarios for you to try. This, of course, applies to not only server side, but also client side templating. So the same very code could be applied in a uh, HTML page where you have a, a just basically a shopping cart uh, entirely running on the client side. So if you make changes, now obviously when things are down on the client and executing in somebody's browser, it's difficult to change the source template. Uh, uh, because you no longer have access to it. But uh, if you refresh the page or whatever, then the change could be applied. All right. Um, so all of this templating can also facilitate reactivity. So within your templates, so here what I have is, is a highlight of like these five lines. I don't know if you can actually see them. But here there, there is the index template, which is the whole type space. Uh, coming from the type provider. Inside is a list item template, which has, you know, basic things uh, like uh, some placeholders, there's an event handler for clearing and, and so on. But what, what I, can, I can do here is I can, I can connect things uh, into the model that I may have uh, serving uh, this particular page. So the data stored within the page can also be reactive bound to the template. And in this case, task.name, for example, is an example of that. So we have a list model, uh, tasks, uh, which is defined above. You can see that list model that created in line 18. This is just basically a dictionary or a list of uh, task uh, values. And uh, you may have one or you may have zero, or you may have a hundred of these tasks inside that uh, model. And what we're doing here is we're loading a template, which is just basically the design, how things should be uh, displayed. We are applying that to every one of these items. So if my tasks changes programmatically or from the UI, then things automatically uh, refresh. 
Now, we could spend probably two hours explaining how the diffing works. So uh, similar flame frameworks, uh, like for example, React, they have uh, different ways to deal with this, this problem. Some of the uh, uh, UI foundations have uh, representations for uh, uh, basically a virtual DOM, and then they have uh, changes that are uh, to be applied on top of what we can see on the screen. And then these changes can be basically handpicked and identified exactly where they happen. And then the code that updates based on our change set is actually quite efficient. So we apply the diff uh, between two DOMs onto the existing one, and then we arrive at the second uh, version of the, uh, the tree. So this way we minimize the number of operations to sort of sync UI changes, but everything else that didn't need to change remains the same. Now, obviously, this is a this can be a heavy computation and an expensive computation if your DOM, which is the thing that you represent uh, for, for your document, is large. So, most of the cases, you know, web web application designers have this guideline not to have too much scrolling within a page, but you can also imagine situations where things are just basically not visible. Like you may have an SPA, which has a lot of functionality on two or three different pages, but only one of the pages are shown at any given time. But that doesn't mean that your DOM doesn't have the rest of the pages. So in reality, it's very easy to run into situations where you're working with thousands, tens of thousands of DOM nodes within your tree. Now, obviously, if you do DOM diffing, uh, that can actually slow things down quite a bit. So WebShopper doesn't do DOM diffing. It uses uh, sort of like a data flow uh, algorithm to propagate changes. And then we have reactive, uh, basically, things that allow you to expose the changes in reactive uh, state into uh, and reflect those changes into HTML. And uh, this will be an example of those uh, UI designs uh, coming from a template, but also having the ability to be connected into this reactive framework. All right, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say about WebShopper. So there are many talks, huge amounts of documentation about WebShopper on the, on the internet. Now let's switch to Bolero, which is the other uh, topic of interest. So Bolero basically runs on Blazor. We'll talk about Blazor in a second. And it gives you the ability to program these Blazor applications in F Sharp using the MVU pattern. So MVU is the model view update. And Bolero itself comes with a lot of WebShop inspired features. Uh, for example, endpoints. Uh, so type representing uh, endpoints, possible endpoints into your application. Then uh, from this, you can imply that uh, there's this whole topic of routing, how you route uh, things uh, in between uh, the different sections of your, of, of your application, uh, the same kind of HTML template and more. So for example, uh, we saw inline HTML and we sort of advised against using too much of it and uh, instead just uh, referring you to use HTML templates. In Bolero, the same applies, but in case you want to do inline HTML, there is now an alternative proposal for its syntax. This is using compu computation expressions. Uh, so it would look something like this. Uh, the, one of the biggest, biggest benefits of, of uh, having an alt alternative uh, syntax for HTML and in this case, the one using competition expressions is because of recent innovations in the F-Sharp compiler, um, the ability to extend uh, inlining in certain situations. It turns out that you can reduce something like this into very efficient chain of function calls, uh, which then if you execute would be a lot less work and also a lot less memory consumption than having an actual data value representation of the HTML, which you accumulate uh, with your HTML combinators, which then you print into HTML at the end somewhere in the pipeline. So this actually, this alternate syntax 
involves uh, a pretty heavy dose of optimization and performance benefits in most of the scenarios. Now, obviously, this wouldn't deal with a scenario where you need to inspect or introspect uh, the content of the HTML that you may have assembled uh, elsewhere and you need to change it in, in certain places. So it doesn't have introspection abilities because at this point, everything is just a whole chain of function calls. But you very typically don't need that kind of introspection. And all you need is just being able to declaratively uh, write out what kind of HTML you want. And here's the structure, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, you can track the progress of that. So that's pretty much ready uh, to be released, and it should probably be out soon. You can see on the bottom, there's a link for the GitHub issue. OK, uh, I'm not going to talk about templates again, because this is exactly the same uh, capability that we saw earlier with WebSharper. Uh, I just want to, this was supposed to be a video. OK, here's a video. So this is uh, just shows you the power of the uh, templating engine. <clears throat> so here I have a running application and you can go out and basically change the underlying template. And in this case, we turn a button into a link just by uh, uh, changing that uh, inner template and saving it. And as soon as we saved it, you see on the right hand side, the buttons have uh, switched to a, a hyperlink instead. No recompilation took place in the server side. <clears throat> it's just a simple uh, file system watch. Uh, and then sending a notification to the client to refresh. All of that <clears throat> is uh, uh, sort of included, better is included in, in, uh, in, in the library when you use Bolero. Of course, obviously, you can disable uh, this hot loading, hot reload functionality. I will show you in some of the code snippets coming up where you can actually do that. Okay, remoting, of course, is one of the fundamental pieces that you need to do uh, in a uh, web framework or a web library. Now, obviously, uh, WebSharper has, and also Bolero has not, uh, not a number, but several or two or three different approaches to get remoting expressed. Here's one way you can define sort of a a record for your uh, service type. So basically listing the RPC functions you want to have. Uh, you can uh, basically uh, define this uh, record type and you can inject it using the remote member on uh, the program component, which represents uh, an MVU uh, based application in Bolero. And then once you have that injected, in, in this case, uh, as backend, then you can pass it down onto your update function and then the update function using that backend reference can make the appropriate calls on different messages as it receives them. Uh, there are other ways you can do dependency injection, et cetera, et cetera. You can basically read that in the documentation. It's not that important which flavor you decide. Now, WebShopper traditionally, for example, have used a, a third approach where we just basically go through the F-Shop code and we mark using the RPC attribute certain functions that then suddenly become available for uh, RPC uh, calls. And the compiler makes sure that if you're translating F-Shop code to JavaScript, which then calls uh, a function that all of those functions are either placed on the JavaScript side or they better be marked as RPC and sit on, on, a, on a server somewhere. So that's all checked and taken care of by the compiler itself. Now routing, um, here's an example. You typically, uh, so you have an endpoint type uh, for your pages and then in your model, in the state of your application, you want to basically track which page you are on. So here, obviously the, in the model, there's a page component and then also somewhere in your messages you need to define, hey, here's a message that sets a new page, which basically means move to a different page of the application. And then router.infer in the bottom takes care of all the work involved. Uh, okay, we have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna just rush through this. I mentioned how you can turn on uh, hot reloading for templates. Here, the highlighted line, the very last one, basically adds a router. 
Similarly, there will be program dot and then uh, use hot reload, etc. So there's a whole bunch of capabilities in that uh, module. All right. So uh, just to briefly compare uh, Bolero versus Web Chopper, uh, you pretty much on the UI paradigm, you stick with MVU on Bolero. On Web Chopper, you have MVU, but you have a lot of uh, different approaches based on the reactivity framework that we provide. But the full stack aspect that when you have a Bolero application, of course, we haven't talked about the different hosting models for Blazor, but uh, on Bolero, you typically have the client uh, running as a .NET uh, application on a WebAssembly runtime. So this is the uh, uh, Blazor WebAssembly uh, approach. But with WebShopper, we take the same .NET code, we translate to JavaScript, and then that runs on the client. Okay. Uh, so why would you use Blazor? Uh, so this is uh, not a talk on that because this is just one of the fundamental pieces that we rely on. But basically, it allows you to move away from JavaScript to .NET for your uh, client-side code, which also brings a, a large part of the .NET ecosystem to the client uh, because it actually can run in, in a WebAssembly interpreted uh, uh, .NET runtime. You may actually have a pretty good performance compared to JavaScript but you definitely have a better reliability and security guarantees uh, because of the uh, uh, WebAssembly uh, runtime and just running WebAssembly in, in a contained manner. And also better code sharing, of course, you have between your .NET source uh, server and client uh, language parts. So here are the three different uh, Blazor hosting models. You can have the WebAssembly, which I just explained, the server model is a very interesting model where everything is running on the server and we just basically send DOM changes using signal R back to the client. This is computationally and resource uh, usage wise very heavy as you have more and more users accessing your website. So this is not something that you should use on a large scale, but this would be very, very perfect for uh, uh, just small scale testing of your web application before you roll it out. There's a new hybrid approach where you can build native applications and you have a web view that basically is running on top of Blazor. You can read more about these hosting models on the link below. Now here's an MVU, uh, model view update uh, application. We had already seen how you communicate using messages and change and update the model uh, that you have using the update function. And then here's the view typically in Blazor or uh, sorry, Bolero and WebShop applications you use HTML templating, you set up certain things, and, and, and then from some of these you dispatch events. Like here, decrement and increment will be buttons uh, to increment the counter. Uh, and value is the thing that you see as the current value. You can see that on a setter, you also dispatch a message. And this will be the source HTML template for, for, for that uh, view function. And this is what it would look like. Uh, really, what I wanted to discuss is the uh, To Do MVC app. Uh, this is an application that basically almost 99% uh, the same in Web Shopper and in Bolero. You have a couple of things that you can change uh, to go in between the two. Of course, obviously, you need to swap out the dependencies instead of relying on Web Shopper. You need to change them to Bolero. And then you can take the very same F sharp code or most of mostly the same F sharp code. And then suddenly, instead of targeting JavaScript for your client uh, using WebSharper, you now had switched your application to uh, targeting uh, or running in a WebAssembly runtime. So uh, you can learn about this in the sample project, of course, in the GitHub repo the GitHub link that I uh, showed in the bottom. Uh, there's one bit of, it of information that I should highlight here, that if you do use the Web Shopper MVU approach, so basically stick, you stick with generating JavaScript, uh, you will find that from the traditional model view update, uh, the render function somewhat de uh, uh, deviates because it takes not the model, but the view of the model. This is a, a small and fine detail that I think is kind of underappreciated at this moment. 
it basically just means that instead of having access to the raw model so that you can change it, you can't. So this makes it the model uh, and, 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 and appreciates that the model is not changeable in the render function. Obviously, it's not changeable in, in the MVU because you, you're passing the model as a value. Uh, but uh, this is just a subtle distinction and just a small difference that you uh, need to be aware of. Other than that, there's a website for MVU. Let me just show you that. I think uh, if I can switch over. Uh, see these. Uh, so here's MVU itself. You can learn about the architecture, uh, some of the features like time travel debugging. This is not something that's up to date. So there's a security warning because the plugin used for uh, the time travel debugging is actually uh, getting outdated and have some warnings. You can uh, use local storage, HTML templating. There's a paging mechanism coming with WebShop or MVU. So here's the routing. And then the differences that I was talking about. And then some of the applications, some sample repositories that you can learn from. All right. And just finally, uh, before we kind of close, uh, here is a uh, MVU, somewhat sl slightly larger example where we use components in other components. So this is like a scalability uh, topic here. Uh, this actually defines a counter like we have seen, but also puts multiple of these counters on a single page. And you can see how we compose messages into each other to sort of have this subsumption into uh, uh, a larger component. All right. Um, I think there are a couple of things that I just kind of rushed over. Uh, and before I close, I really should mention uh, Blazor A A AOT, which is the ahead of time compilation. So basically having the same ability that we have seen, uh, but compiling down not to uh, .NET DLLs, but to WebAssembly directly now. Obviously the output size is going to be larger, but it's definitely going to be faster than the interpreted uh, uh, approach with a Blazor WebAssembly. So this is something that we need to pay very close attention to. I think it has a lot of potential because this is now saying that you can take any .NET language, F sharp, C sharp, whatnot, and compile it down directly to WebAssembly. Now, this also means that you can interrupt with a huge and growing WebAssembly ecosystem coming from your .NET uh, application code base. Now, obviously, uh, at this point, we have to say and point out that WebAssembly still lacks access to certain features for example, to the DOM itself. So we are falling back to using JavaScript for these, but only for now. So a lot of people are anxiously awaiting when uh, WebAssembly is able to access the DOM because at that point, a lot of the JavaScript dependencies can go away. Uh, and just closing down, I really would like to mention and point out the Rust community and all the work that they have been doing on WebAssembly. They have this wonderful uh, ecosystem. Uh, they can compile to WebAssembly very efficiently. They also have tooling, for example, to take JavaScript libraries and J JavaScript code in general and provide bindings uh, to those JavaScript code uh, pieces by generating stubs that you can then use in your application that's, that you compile to WebAssembly. So it's really a cool approach. And I think it's a wonderful way to build applications. Now, obviously, this is exactly the same kind of situation that .NET would arrive in once we have the AOT compilation uh, refined, producing small that code eliminated uh, and uh, optimized code. And hopefully we'll get, get there or at least get somewhat closer in .NET 7. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm going to be hanging out in the lounge uh, to answer any questions you may have. And otherwise, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Granit. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging around and listening to Granit.